Hello, hi there. Welcome to the Guiding Voice podcast series. The Guiding Voice for a better future. This podcast is to help students and young professionals to shape their careers. In every episode, we interact with industry experts to drive some insightful conversations that will help our audience learn great things. We also share an interesting trivia and fun fact about the IT world towards the end of every episode. Thank you for tuning in. This is Naveen and I'm with my co-host Sudhakar. So dear listeners, today we are going to discuss one of the most revolutionary technologies that is cloud computing. And the topic for today's episode is how cloud adoption can help the businesses in this UCA world. And we are pleased to welcome Pankaj to our show today. A technical leader with over 13 years of IT experience, Pankaj Mishra has expertise in customer relationship management, global service delivery, risk management, account strategy, team building and innovation. Pankaj has experience in various facets of the industry starting from development, application and maintenance support, IT infrastructure support to delivery, IT strategy, transition management, people management, stakeholder management, program and account management. Pankaj has proven record of identifying and executing areas for innovation and automation of IT operations, cloud managed services, analytical services. He is passionate about inspiring, educating, coaching, mentoring, leading and empowering teams across the geographies. Pankaj, welcome to our The Guiding Voice again. Hey, thank you so much. Thank you so much, uh, Sudhakar, for that wonderful introduction. I might not have been able to introduce myself so richly, so thank you again. It's our privilege, Pankaj. Let us start our conversation with your career journey. How did it start and how did you reach your current position? All right. So uh, I started off as a novice and I still remember the day I went for my interview in uh, one of the Lady Shri Ram colleges in Delhi. Mm -hmm. And that's when just out of college, I saw a mass gathering of over 2000 people and I was very, very nervous. And I was so nervous that I wanted to go back home. But then somebody, something said inside me, no, let's let's face it. Let's see where I stand. So I got into uh, the group discussions and uh, the group discussions went fine interview went fine and I got selected and that was the first time when I was stepping out of home alone and that too from North India to South India and Chennai. So the first thing was how will you get So we went there, we went to Accenture, so my first company was Accenture and uh, still remember the first day when we saw curd rice in the buffet and we thought that's Kheer and we took two bowls (laughs) of that uh, as a dessert after lunch and the first bite when we took we had a strange face. So we asked the local local friends over there, so, hey guys, what is this? Then we got to know, okay, this is the very famous curd rice, right? So that's where it all started. So I started off as a, a Siebel developer and slowly moved on into the Siebel support for the same project. Slowly and steadily, I started um, making advances towards learning the server administrator part of it. And I was into Siebel support until almost five to seven years of my career. I traveled to uh, UK uh, for around a span of five years in 2011 and that was more like a company sponsored honeymoon because I got married in February and we traveled to UK after a few months. So I still consider that as a company sponsored honeymoon and yes, the experiences over there probably made me the guy that I am today. So um, my manager over there, uh, Richard Kundal, uh, who's a good friend now today. For me, he's been one of the best managers that I have worked with so far in my career and for a variety of reasons. Slowly but steadily, it's like uh, when you're reaching a, maybe a mid-career plateau in your career, you kind of always thinking, how do I break this ceiling, a glass ceiling that is there on top of your head. Now, why I call this a glass ceiling is it's transparent, right? If you look up, like the word, the sky is the limit. But the moment you reach the ceiling, you're stuck, right? And I was stuck in that kind of a support role. And I was thinking, what next in my career? So you've got to be very mindful of where the market is heading, what the market trends are from a technology standpoint. And that's when I learned, okay, cloud computing. That's where the market is heading. And that's when I took my baby steps towards cloud computing. And 
Five years down the line, today I play a role of a cloud advisor where I help many clients and my customers in their cloud journey from on-premise to cloud and so on and so forth. So here I am today. That's an amazing journey, Pankaj. And uh, because you mentioned about curd rice, it reminds me of my days in 1999 when I went to Delhi, although I was a South Indian. So that Delhi experience is, I think, completely opposite to what you had from North to South. Amazing experience again. So now that you mentioned that you are working as cloud advisor, can you please define cloud computing in layman terms? how it is different from the traditional on-premise data center world. Okay, so in a very layman language, so these are two terms clubbed together. One is cloud and the other one is computing. Now, (laughs) cloud is nothing but unlimited space, as simply put. And then you talk about computing. Computing is nothing but the way of accessing resources. Now, what resources? It could be a database resource, it could be a server resource, it could be a network resource, it could be your uh, virtual machines, and so on and so forth. Hence, unlimited space for your computing resources where you create them over the internet. That's what is called cloud computing. And all you just need is a web browser and an internet connection. Now take an example of the pre-cloud computing world. Right. So that time, uh, it's like if you got to have any kind of a application running on an on-premise. So what all do you do? Mm-hmm. Now, if you talk about say classic data centers, right, a location where all your physical servers reside, right. So every organization these days used to have their data centers with physical hardware residing in them. Traditionally, you would have your hardware on top of which you will install your operating system, and on top of which you install your virtual machines. And on top of those virtual machines, you would install and configure your applications. Now, buying that hardware was neither easy nor cheap and extremely difficult to maintain. You've got to have a dedicated room. You've got to have security personnel for that who's guarding that room for you. You've got to have your network engineer, application administrators to manage your data center. And just if you reflect upon it, all this cumbersome and extremely tasks that you're doing it's only to launch a simple application. If I give you a little bit of more analysis, a hardware as low as say eight CPU and 16 GB RAM would cost you anywhere between three to four lakhs, mm-hmm. right? On top of the operating system licenses, engineer cost, resources, so on and so forth. And they keep adding to the capital expenditure. So you're easily looking at 10 to 15 lakhs to set up a small data center bare minimum. Now this is called CAPEX, which is all the upfront expense that you need to invest even before you get started with the actual work, right? So such was the magnitude of the background work and the cost that had to be done to develop just a simple application, which obviously also was not a very scalable solution to have. If you think about it, why didn't we have so many startups maybe 10 years before? Mm -hmm. Capital expenditure was the whole reason. Not everybody would have that kind of a capital expenditure. That's when ever since cloud came in, Startups became a common commodity in terms of ease of business where you wanted to start up. All you need is an infrastructure, a set of servers. You create a say, and if I talk about AWS, you create an account, host a few servers in a matter of clicks of buttons, get a developer to write a code, publish on your servers, and voila, your application is up and running. So easy to do that, right? And the best part of all is no upfront cost. You get a bill at the end of the month based on the usage and you just pay it off. It's a good trade-off between your CAPEX and OPEX. Now, you also said uh, virtualization, right? So virtualization, if I have to give you a very simple layman example, virtualization is nothing but just like a school bus. Mm -hmm. Before the school bus was invented, every parent would use their own cars to drive their kids to school using extra fuel, resources, and all of that. Obviously, uh, a car would have a certain capacity, right? Maybe you can fit in five kids, but not all the kids of the colony, right? So obviously, for all the kids to reach the college, maybe 10 or 20 cars are driving to the school. Look at the amount of resources, look at the amount of fuel, look at the amount of time is going on. So putting obviously all the kids in one vehicle also was an option. So one day the school bus got introduced, exposing the inefficiency of every parent driving the kid to school separately. Now, by using the school bus, parents could use less fuel, fewer cars, uh, fewer vehicles on the road, all while transporting all the kids together. Yeah. And that's when cloud came in 
and everybody is traveling together so now it's a more generous world than a more uh, selfish world which i call the virtualization world <laughs> beautiful examples very well put through pankaj now can we talk a little bit about myths of cloud computing the myths of cloud computing the myths of cloud computing as steve jobs also says when he launched his apple iphone he used to say when he was talking about his icloud drives so the biggest myth is that people consider okay i have my c drive and a d drive lying somewhere on the cloud that's one of the biggest myths it's not that you obviously you've got to do a lot of homework you've got to do a lot of configurations and then we think that yes it will be extremely cheap well yes it is a relative term that you have relative term that you have if say your on premise is costing you 100 rupees mm-hmm. probably your cloud will cost you maybe 40 rupees but does not mean it will cost you just 1 rupee because anyways you're provisioning servers you've got your production workloads running on that so the cost part is one of the biggest myths that i encounter from people when they say oh it's very cheap and it's very easy to configure mm-hmm. well talk to us uh, when we work on cloud we understand how difficult Yeah, I would not say it's difficult, but it's definitely a quite an interesting job to configure everything on the cloud, which also has its own challenges, own kind of uh, issues. But yes, as compared to on-premise, I would certainly love to work on cloud any day. That's cool. And now, when we talk about cloud computing, we often hear about as a service. We come across IaaS, PaaS, and SaaS. Can you throw some light around these words? Oh, absolutely. So, what is AIS? IaaS so that's infrastructure as a service and then you have your SaaS which is your software as a service and then you've got your PaaS right which mm-hmm. is platform as a service again let me give you an analogy okay i love my analogies and examples which makes it very easy for people to understand mm-hmm. okay so you say you have your own car mm-hmm. right and obviously how do you own one you first need to pay the entire car cost either through a loan or you pay the entire down payment what is that capital expenditure right on premise so once you own it obviously you are only responsible for insurance servicing fuel essentially saying everything is your responsibility and this is nothing but an on premise model okay now say you don't have a car of your own okay and you want to drive to goa yeah minus the covid scene imagine that we are not in a covid era uh, so you don't have a car of your own and, and you still want to drive to goa and the whole duration you want to keep the car with yourself is 7 days So what would you do? You would rent a car. What would you pay for? You only pay for the seven days of the rent. Where I am saying that you only pay for the services that you use, which is nothing but the car, and only for the number of days that you use it. And this is nothing but IaaS, infrastructure as a service. So the infrastructure in the form of a car is presented to you, and you just use it, right? Now say you don't have a car, and you also want to go to office, but at the same time. you don't want to keep the car with you for the entire day so what do you do and obviously you don't rent it because you don't want to keep it for the entire day what do you do pick up the phone ola uber right where someone else drives the car for you and what do you pay for you only pay for the duration and the distance that the car runs so you are utilizing a service from point a to point b hence you're not even paying for the fuel as well while in ias you were paying for the fuel that you were using right when traveling to goa so just using the service and this is called platform as a service now in say aws terminologies you've got something called an elastic beanstalk i have not seen such a service ever in my career where you've got a developer that developer has a code and mm-hmm. that de- developer has no idea about servers he does not even understand the term virtualization or servers or auto scaling whatever he just say hey listen pankaj i have my piece of code can you launch this application for me i pick yeah. the code from him use the service and in a matter of minute the application is up and running without him even bothering about what is going behind the scenes so that's pass now you think that you want to avail the service of a bus or a metro mm-hmm. okay where the bus or the metro obviously it is not owned by you nor have you called it exclusively for yourself mm-hmm. this car ola uber you got exclusively for yourself unless it is a ola ola share or uber share right yeah. yeah but this is not exclusively for yourself correct yeah. and obviously they run on their own time they don't even wait for you so it's neither owned by you nor have you called it exclusively for yourself and this is nothing but a software as a service mm-hmm. great example is google outlook 
what do you do you just log in send a email log out are you bothered about when google will be down or are you bothered about the underlying architecture absolutely no so this is a very good example of saas so if i have to sum it up so on premise was what when everyone was happy and everybody had their roles and jobs for almost all the layers because here you needed to take care of everything from bottom to top and everything was your responsibility adding to the obviously the headache of managing everything but then the moment cloud comes into picture now ias a certain level of uh, stack of the layers is already provided to you as a managed service pass service even much more where you're only bothered about your application and the data and when it comes to saas the entire seven layers of stack it is taken care of the, by the service provider managed service so only bothered about modernizing your applications and mobile apps whatever it is so yeah that's the difference Pankaj, great examples and easy to understand. You know, as of now, we generally hear about Amazon Web Services from Amazon, Azure from Microsoft, and GCP from Google being the three major cloud vendors in today's market. What should businesses or the organizations look before signing up or committing to a specific cloud provider? Now the first thing that any business would want to move to any cloud as such they need to ask themselves why am i even moving towards cloud is it because i want to close my data center down and maybe build a new one or i just want to maybe modernize my applications based on all these information that you have you've got something called a recovery point objective where businesses and the cloud vendor will discuss and come to an agreement okay how much of a data am i okay to lose in case anything goes wrong then comes your recovery time objective where again the vendor and the organization will come to terms wherein how much of a downtime am i okay to have so these are all business use cases when you go in kind of discussion with these cloud vendors so what i would really sum it up as that if you are okay with one cloud service provider majorly and more often than not all the service cloud providers would be having the same kind of services the only the terminology is changed not much of a difference but then you would also want to look at okay what is the market cap of the organization we mm-hmm. obviously look at your gartner's quadrant reports who's leading AWS obviously has been the front runner for cloud infrastructure as a service for the 10th year this year. So if say for example my focus is that I want to modernize my infrastructure as a service as such, I would blindly go towards AWS and that's my own opinion. Mm-hmm. People might differ. People might want to go with Azure, maybe they would want to go with Google. So it's entirely what you want to go with. Now also depends. Now for example, all your software and the hardware layers, say for example these are Microsoft products, right it would obviously make sense to go with microsoft azure because then your os can be just extended towards the cloud and you can take calls according to that yep wonderful insights pankaj we have spoke a lot about the benefit that are being offered by various cloud providers and also the advantages of cloud computing in total so what are the challenges that you see in cloud computing See one of the biggest challenges that we see is whenever we are talking about a cloud migration kind of a strategy which is called the 6 hours strategy okay mm-hmm. so it's like rehost refactor replatform retire retain and rearchitecting now the biggest challenge is that for example you you have your legacy applications working on on premise mm-hmm. for example a siebel crm or a erp kind of a solution Mm-hmm. to move the entire stack from a legacy application to an on prem that's when it requires a lot and lot of work in terms of integrations you actually might want to move to a different product altogether where maybe for a civil crm you want to move to a salesforce.com sfdc so one of the biggest challenges how to move the legacy applications from on prem to cloud one of the also the bigger factor is where the first thing that obviously comes to mind is okay is my data secure we come across with a lot of clients and customers who are very particular about the data where they don't want their data to be leaving the data center of their country altogether they don't want the data to be crossing the country borders so that's when you come towards maybe a hybrid kind of a model where your data will be on your on premise data center but maybe your front end application might move towards cloud so these kind of uh, conversation with the clients at times become very challenging 
especially the clients they have a very conservative about uh, embracing cloud as a platform yeah so it's majorly to do with your uh, data and security and obviously your legacy application how would they function on cloud so pankaj changing the gears a bit here what are your tips for students and young professionals that are aspiring to make it big not necessarily in cloud uh, arena only but in general in the industry and in their careers the biggest advice that i always give to the student community is that setbacks and failures are okay mm-hmm. silly laughs are okay and asking for help is definitely okay so always question yourself and always have that kid inside you ignited mm-hmm. a kid is a person who is a curiosity box never let that curiosity die and the moment you get inside your organization it's very important to know your company first of all every company will have a lot of portals a lot of resources to know about your company and obviously that's not going to happen in a day it evolves with a period of time once you get into a project it's very easy to go into that cycle where okay you come at 9 o'clock you leave at 6 you've been given a job and you do the job and you come out of the job but it's very very important to know your customer what are the pain points of the customer are you reading between the lines because majority of the crowd you will find yeah i've got a job to do i'll come at 9 o'clock and i'll leave at 6 i'll do my work but how many of us take that extra stride to know the customer to understand what the pain points are who are my competitors because it's often said that your customer will always have an eye on your competitors also and if you are not keeping an eye on your competitors mm-hmm. and the moment the customer finds an added value in your competitors i really don't have to say what will happen next so it's very important to know your company your customer and your competitor very important to end with to want to be ambitious and to be successful is not enough unless you act everything goes for a toss if you don't act thank you so much for joining us today pankaj we really appreciate you taking time and helping us and our audience go and talk about the current trending topic which is cloud it was indeed a great discussion on cloud computing totally my pleasure thank you for having me here thank you pankaj appreciate your time dear listeners to know more about our speaker and the content visit or follow us on social media we are available on linkedin facebook insta twitter pinterest and also on youtube just search for the guiding voice and follow like subscribe to us and also share within your network also feel free to email us at the guiding voice for you that is t h e g u i d i n g v o i c e four as a digit u at gmail dot com or whatsapp us on india number nine four nine four five eight seven one eight seven again it is india number nine four nine four five eight seven one eight seven and we will be happy to collaborate with you all right so it brings us to the trivia segment of today's episode. and today's trivia is about wikipedia so you know wikipedia needs an army of anti vandal bots mission of wikipedia is to make knowledge freely available to everyone with access to the internet however anyone with internet access can also sign up and edit pages so which results in what they call vandalism so for those of you who are not aware of vandalism it means someone purposefully altering facts with malicious intent and it is a very robust moderation system there is so much that a person can do in terms of actively monitoring changes and correcting changes that vandals make that's where the bots the essentially computer programs come into picture and the bots say for example cluebot ng keeps a track of all the changes made to any page and instantly revert back to the correct version if a vandal decides to change things there are about 1941 bots that are authorized for use on the 38 million 818162 wikipedia pages as of the last count interesting isn't it thank you for listening there is more in store folks so stay tuned have a wonderful time until next time bye bye